Well, hello from Emerald Hill Skies. My name is Doug, and it's great to have you here tonight. I uh, wasn't sure the clouds would uh, part in time for us to be able to start, but I think they have, and so uh, welcome. We're pointing the scope currently at a part of the sky. Let's see if we can get you uh, to look here. It's a part of the sky that's headed toward the west-southwest. And we're only about uh, 22 degrees above the horizon. Uh, pretty low considering this is the area of worst light pollution. And for orientation's sake, you might notice that here is Sirius. And I'm really serious. Uh, in Canis Major, you also might, uh, you know, have, have ever learned the constellation uh, Gemini with the two Castor and Pollux head stars up here at the top. Uh, tonight, you might have noticed bright, bright Venus right above the horizon and the moon shining over here. So for orientation, this is like I say, the worst part. Louisville's light dome is exactly in this part of the sky. We're trying to catch a very, very small uh, target. It's called NGC 2316. NGC 2316. And uh, I don't know, uh, basically it's a kind of tiny, tiny star cluster that has a little nebulosity around it. And here's a live view through our Rasa 11. Notice all this uh, light pollution here. My light pollution filter is doing the best job that it can, but this part of the sky, if you'd like to see for orientation, here's a picture of our, of our sky cam. And that glow over the horizon is really, honestly, the light dome of Louisville. So it's a wonder at just uh, 20 degrees above the horizon that we can see anything. But the target that we're looking for, I'll put deep sky annotation here on for you so that we can circle it, is sure enough, NGC 2316. And what it consists of is this tiny, tiny cluster. There are really just two stars here. But let's zoom in past our optical. There's 100% optical. Let's zoom in a little bit tighter. See if we can maybe darken the sky a little more. And maybe with the sky darker, we can pop up the mids a little bit and see a little bit more of this nebulosity. This nebulosity would remind you of what we see around the M45, the Pleiades, it really is just some, some puffiness around these two stars here. But if you use your imagination, and I mean imagination, I mean you've got to use your imagination, there is the slightest fan shape toward these three stars. You've got to really use your imagination. That's that's the diffuse nebula that we're trying to see here. And it really is just a little bit of cloudiness around those two stars. And Omira talks about it. He says, you know, this is so small in the beginning. It's just four arc minutes wide, for Pete's sake. Let me check our... Um, I'm going to try to see if I can... Double check, see if I can double check and just make sure our audio is coming through here. Here we are. Let's listen to this audio real quick. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so let's come back to the screen. And uh, these tiny two stars here that you see, just a little bit of nebulosity, Wendy, hello from North Carolina, and uh, Ty Kim, good to see you as well. Mike, glad to have you on board from Atlanta. Don, that would be great if we could see uh, auroras tonight. That'd be awesome. Uh, so really, this just this little bit of bulbulous nebulosity is all we're we're looking at here. Omira said um, this is a cometary nebula. That's what it was called. It's just a little bit of like a few small clouds and dust 
that are being lit up by those two little young lightweight stars, maybe 10 million years old, about three solar masses is all. And uh, it's really just a little tiny cloud around those two little stars an irregularly round glow with a fainter fan of nebulosity stretching toward the arc. Hard to make out any definition of the fan, he said. It's just like a delicate bubble of glowing gas surrounding and centered on the middle star of the arc, uh, the one closest to the nebula. So, I mean, we can sort of strain our eyes. Now, maybe at, we're now at uh, 24 minutes. I started this before before we ever started the uh, live stream. Maybe now, even though that light pollution is strong, oh boy, there's not much there. Not much there at all, is there? But you can definitely see the bubbles of clouds around these two stars, can't you? So that's this target. It's. Uh, it's just a diffuse nebula, very tiny, about four arc minutes, hanging at 20 degrees above the brightest Bortle 6 light pollution in our sky. But we could still make out the nebulosity around the, uh, what would that be called, a double star. Not, not a lot of the fan shape. There it is, NGC 2316. All right, so. Um, Thanks for being with us tonight. Um, Don, good to have you on board as well. Let's see, our next target is NGC 2343. 2343. And this is an open cluster in Monoceros. It's also at 21 degrees, so not real high above the horizon. Only six arc minutes wide, very, very tiny cluster. Let's see. A little slew on over there. We're using a different uh, angle, a different camera angle tonight for the scope camera. We have that, that camera at the base of the pier, and we're aiming straight up at it. You think it already slewed? Didn't look like it moved very much to me. Let's uh, let's take a look here and figure out where it's supposed to be. Yep, still the same part of the sky. South, southwest maybe, or west, yeah, west, southwest. Wow, this is a busy, a busy part of the sky. And we're looking for NGC 2343. I wonder if that's the double mint cluster. It is. NGC 2343, the double mint cluster. We'll probably get in some kind of trouble with the chewing gun company. Mike saw it move. Okay. So we're going to say, yes, it's settled. And it's plate solving. Now, if you've been on the channel before, you're probably familiar with our term uh, plate solving. It means you're taking a picture of the stars actively, comparing with the stars in your database of your mount. And then uh, using the comparison, the mount tries to synchronize the live view pointing exactly with the expectation uh, that we hope to see using the reference uh, database of, of star images. So that's what's happening. Now, I wonder if the double mint cluster comes from the fact that there really are two little clusters here. 
That is a little bit brighter. It looks kind of like mint green, doesn't it? Let's see if we can see any of this here. Whoops, I moved. Not a lot that we can make out there. Boy, this is a sure a uh, an active part of the sky, isn't it? With that, this giant seagull's wing, or whatever this is called. I don't know what this nebula is called. Seagull's wings. Yeah, I guess you could see a seagull. Got to tilt your head pretty far. We're not going to see that. We're zoomed in on. Uh, well, we might see a little bit of it. The double mint cluster, NGC 2343. Change view. Thank you very much. Mike's watching our back here. An active part of the sky. And we're looking at, uh, look, this is Canis Major. You can really see the shape of a dog there, can't you? See the head and Sirius here, a little tail. And he's barking up at that. Uh, he's looking up at this very double mint cluster. And look at how much nebulosity there is here in the seagull's wings. All right, so that's our planetarium software. Let's change over and see what we can see with our live view. So this is a live view. And again, this is a very light polluted part of the sky. We're at least going to see that cluster though. If we, don't make, if we don't make out much of all that nebulosity yet, we're going to be able to see that cluster. You can start to see some of the nebulosity, can't you? Look how this has got a, an overall reddish color which reminds you of this overall reddish color here. And in that cradle of nebulosity is this double mint cluster. We're kind of looking at it here. This entire, this entire area will eventually fill with nebulosity. But the double mint cluster is this cluster here, open cluster. And we'll um, queue up our observation panel here where we can make a note or two. And let's see what Amira says. This is um, secret deep object number 33. It's a coarse and fairly bright open cluster. And He says, the view is glorious. Many single suns can now be seen as double or multiple pairs. The longer I look, the more pairs I see. Each corner star of the pyramid is a multiple. Pyramid. Hmm. I guess this is the upside, I guess this is a pyramid, huh? And he says each corner star is a multiple. Let's zoom in a little bit more. We can see this multiple. But I don't know, I guess there would be a, a double there. You can maybe see the slightest oval shape here. The double mint cluster. He says uh, 30 stars. Three major rows. Huh. 
I guess this would be one row, and that would be another row, and this would be another row. We could see the three rows of stars, but Louisville's light dome was uh, diminishing the impact of the Seagull Nebula. 30 stars. Not sure how long we'd have to hang out here to be able to see a nice view of that nebula. We'll try to pump up the mids a little, see if we can't draw a little more of it out. Yeah, there it is. But some of that could also be the trees because getting very low, that's just 15 degrees, so some of that could be the trees. All right, so let's, uh, let's head over to the duck nebula. The Duck Nebula, 15 degrees. And this is, uh, the Duck Nebula is NGC 2359. What we're doing is we're using the Secret Deep uh, the Secret Deep book that Steve O'Meara wrote. And it's kind of a curated list that he created himself. Don, it's very kind of you to uh, remind people to subscribe. I'm trying to make your... Uh, message show up here. The double mint, I don't know that he thought up that name. I think that could have been a, um, a name that preceded him, but he doesn't claim it anyway. He doesn't say, I call it the double mint. He does call it the double mint cluster, but he doesn't say anywhere that he called it that. Not seeing much about it here. All right, so this is the Duck Nebula. Why won't that comment become visible, Don? Don was asking everybody to um, subscribe if you like content like this and to click uh, the like button, uh, thumbs up or the bell if you want to be notified, content like this. But uh, we have the content uh, like automatic moderation on. For some reason it held that comment and I can't seem to get it to... free it up. If you're interested, we're using tonight uh, a Pure Tech Telestation 2 Roloff Roof Observatory. And in that observatory, we have a Rasa 11 inch on a Pure Tech adjustable height pier, Pure Tech 2 adjustable height pier. And that Rasa is the white uh, optical tube assembly you see at the top. And it has, on the end of it, a uh, ZWASI 2600MC Pro, a color one-shot AstroCam. And 
this camera is an APS-C size sensor, pretty good size sensor. And you can see it mounted on an Octopi Astro camera interface, which is mounted on the corrector lens or corrector plate of that Rasa. Seems like I've um, tried to look at this duck nebula once before. Seems like I can never quite get as much out of it as what I should. I think it's right here in the middle, right here, still forming up. Of course, it's only been 100 seconds, but let's go look and see what part of the sky we're looking at one more time. Um, let's see, show chart. Oh, just adjoining to where we were. So it is in that light dome. It's right above Sirius, right above the Canis Major. Thor's, Thor's Helmet is another name for this, this nebula. NGC 2359, Thor's Helmet. Kind of a diffuse thing. Let's see, there's sort of a part of the helmet that's up here, some horns, and then part that's down here. I'm going to have to look up Thor to see this. Tiffany and the Shih Tzu, good to have you on board from California. Tiffany and your dog. Boy, that's a beautiful nebula if we can make it out. Let's see how much we're going to be able to see. Now, these could actually be some trees. This is just starting to go behind those trees, I think. Let's go back and look and see where our horizon is. Wow, it doesn't seem like it should be. Well, maybe so. It says 15 degrees, 14 degrees. Yeah, I guess it could very easily be starting to hit this could be the tree line here but if we look we can see some nebulosity here and some structure can't we but it's not the best image of it for sure I think these are trees let's go look at our sky cam and um, Oh yeah, we're pointed right down into the Louisville Light Dome and those trees. But anyway, we're seeing the structure here. I think this one will deserve coming back to when it's not as low on the horizon. It's more of a January, February object We'll have to come back to it next year, but at least we got to see the structure to a certain extent. Um, Thor's helmet. What would you guess it would cost if I purchased the setup, including the roll-off room? Thanks, looking dark. Kubota Man Dan. You know, I committed to the guy who designed these Pure Tech Observatories not to give prices out over the air, but I will tell you it's thousands of dollars for that Pure Tech Observatory. It's quite a bit of technology. Uh, it's set up so that you don't need any, uh, uh, I don't know how to show you this. Maybe see if you can look out there where the roof rolls off. There's no support structure under that. No support structure at all. It's kind of like pulling a file cabinet out of a file cabinet drawer and it just hangs out there in midair it's all done with, you know, aluminum and it's, you can take it apart and move it if you ever have to. So I won't, uh, I won't be able to tell you the price, but you can look up Pure Tech Observatories and talk to the, to the vendor, to the designer, Vito is his name, and uh, definitely you can uh, check with him. This is a 10 by 10 foot. And of course, you know, it depends on what size you get and what options and all. So there you go. Stu, good to have you aboard. 
Uh, it's not 50 thousandths, dude. Not that much, huh? Not, it's just a, in, a, in fact, it's, I can tell you, I, I will tell you, it's nowhere nearly that expensive, but that's nice of you to guess that. All right, coming back now to the screen to finish this up, we're just going to say Thor's helmet was uh, dropping into the Louisville light dome tonight, but we could still make out the faintest hint of the structure, but we should come back to this one on a clear January night. All right, I think the rest of these should be a lot better in terms of their um, placement in the sky. Here's NGC 6629. NGC 6629. Oh, the whole setup. Oh, yeah, I don't... I, I've never added it up, Stu, because I thought I might get nightmares. So, you know, you're right. You, you can start uh, putting all kinds of values to these things, but I did, I got them one at a time and tried to catch them on sale, and I'll try to pacify myself saying that. Stu, you kind of maybe checked in after we got started here. I was mentioning to the other folks on the stream, this is a different camera view of the scope. What I've done is pulled the uh, the camera away from that corner wall and what this has allowed us to do is to um, be able to function without an extension cable and I'm hoping that will um, allow us to catch the camera consistently. There were several nights that we were trying to see the scope cam and with that extension cable on it, USB extension cable, it just wasn't getting enough voltage to light up, I think. So that's my theory anyway. So now we've located the camera at the base of the scope. There's a nice little uh, stand pipe that comes on, comes up from the floor that's meant for the electricity. And um, we've put it on top that stand pipe in a kind of a a nice location and then that way we can plug it directly into this rig rack at the base of the pier which has all the power distribution boxes and USB uh, it it actually converts it to fiber optic cable uh, and relays it about 200 feet to indoors where I'm sitting inside a nice little warm office and it carries with it all the data from this uh, little sky cam that rides on top of the scope and that's what's giving us this view of the sky try to help us keep connected to the scope let's kind of see where we're pointing um, we change over to the planetarium software you can see we're kind of out of the light dome a little bit now uh, the general lieu of a light dome still extends a little bit here in the northeast but not so much over here in the east-northeast. So this is a little bit better view of the sky and you can see we're just off of the wide part of the Hercules Keystone. Uh, if you look at the Bote's club or upside down ice cream cone, whatever you want to, however you want to feature this, the ice cream would almost be dripping on this. And this is, look at up, up here, it's Polaris and the Little Dipper. So if you take the the two pointer stars off the end of the bowl of the Little Dipper and come down in the direction of Hercules. Uh, that's where we're pointing at the Prize Comet Globular Cluster. And this is NGC 6229. Need to change the name of our NGC 6229. And let's do um, 
display histogram stretch, then a large histogram stretch. And there it is. Like we're going to need to do a focus run in a minute. The temperatures dropped to 36. When we focused tonight, it was 44. So the temperature is dropping rapidly out there. But at least you can see that glob. It's uh, in Hercules, NGC 6229. You know, globular clusters are kind of interesting because they they orbit the Milky Way, I guess, uh, really in every direction. So whereas, you know, the Milky Way is kind of like the uh, solar system in that it's like a, the Milky Way is sort of like disk-like, like the solar system is. And all the planets are roughly, not exactly, but roughly along a disk. But then you've got these uh, globular clusters like this one, and it's spinning around uh, every which way, orbiting outside the disk and perpendicular to the disk, and every angle you can imagine, these 150 or 200, I don't know how many globular clusters there are. And they're very old, they're like, apparent age is like 10 billion years old. Stu, may, maybe you can tell us in a minute what uh, NGC 6229 is. But these things are pretty interesting. Um, some of them have hundreds, some of them thousands of stars. This is uh, in the secret deep list, is object number 74. And he says this is 27,000 light years away approximately. See if that agrees with your around 27,000 light years distant. And he says it's about eight arc minutes extent in the sky. So that's m measuring the angle of sky that it covers. A little bit more reliable than trying to predict how wide it is if we were there to measure it with a tape measure. Talks about the history of this object, the people that have observed it, some blue stragglers making their way out of this. He says it's a nicely condensed globe of light. Now he says actually about four arc minutes wide. I said eight, didn't I? Uh, core is very irregular like lumpy mashed potatoes. Huh. Halo appears softly dappled. Intense disk of light, irregularly round outer halo, yeah. Brightest stars are at magnitude 14. Fantastically compact. The inner halo becomes like a warped bar. Bulges prominently. Flower petal shapes. I guess that's the flower petals would be these bulges out here. As you can see, our focus has suffered. We're going to have to go focus here in a second. Um, irregular around flower petal shapes in the outer halo. Pretty cool uh, globular cluster. So we've got about uh, four, eight, ten objects left that we're going to try to see. Let's go focus very quickly. I'm just going to turn the camera off. Oh, wait. We need to stop the live stacking here. I'm just going to turn the camera off here so we can pick it up in our. Uh, I don't think this globular cluster will affect. I think it'll affect our, um, tell you what though, just in case it would, nah, it shouldn't. Let's 
go ahead and start our um, program called Nina. And this software Nina has a nice automated focusing routine in it. If you have an uh, electronic focuser on your scope, and I have to turn on the camera here now and go to imaging. Temperature out there is about 36 degrees. I really like this new um, Unity platform they're calling it for Astro, Pegasus Astro Powerbox devices. I just love it. I think it's so colorful and smart looking. It looks like something that would be in a Star Trek Enterprise, you know, dashboard. You've got your temperature here, it says it's 36, humidity here, 81, dew point here, 31. It tells the voltage we're using, the current we're drawing, the amount of power we're using up in watts. And then over here you've got charts that are showing you the humidity, the dew point, and the temperature. So am I right, gang? Am I right that when these lines converge, that's when dew would be super, you know, difficult. So built into this, uh, built into this, this device is a dew heater that we use with that black dew band that you see around the very end of the scope there. And it pops electricity in and out of that dew band and that electricity warms up the objective uh, lens slightly and keeps prevents dew from forming on it as long as you have a, a dew shield and we do on the end of the scope there's that black dew shield there um, let's see I guess that's the best view of the Rasa. There you can see, no, you can't see it there. Hmm. Wonder, I guess that's about the best you can see it. Uh, so that black screen protects the corrector plate a little bit, keeps dew from forming on it, but the, these dew heaters are popping on now. It's automatic and it shows their outputs here. They're at about 62% right now. So I really like this uh, Pegasus Astro Unity platform. And you can see that it's, uh, it's what do you call that when it responds? Responsive, that's a good name for it. Responsive, so it'll change uh, size and reconfigure itself based on whatever size you want it to be. So I'm kind of putting it right there and it still retains its color and tells us the temperature at a glance. The autofocusing is a lot of fun, isn't it? Um, let's see. Nice weather station, Don says. Is it equipped with a do wop? <laughs> Good to see the red light district lit up again. Uh, yeah, that, that's actually a snapshot of when I had the red lights on, but out in the observatory, if we could actually, well, you can see a picture of it. It's completely black. The only, the only light that you can see is uh, just the Bortel 6 light dome of the sky kind of peeking in over the side of the observatory there, but I've got the night vision turned way up on this camera. It's a, kind of a night vision style scope. So there is no light out the observ observatory right now. This was just uh, when I took a snapshot of it with those red lights on. But right now it's completely in the dark. Well, you can see we've got a nice uh, hyperbola, whatever it's called, hyperbolic curve going on here. So that should be a good focus. Let's get out of here and catch those 
two objects that are close to the horizon before they sink. So we're coming back out of Nina now, and we'll head back to Sharp Cap. This is uh, Sharp Cap Pro. I'm going to make sure that our pre processing is still hooked up, hot pixel removal, and our correct flats, and they are correct flats are still there. And then we'll Okay, so let's slew to this galaxy. This is NGC 6207. NGC 6207. Sixty two oh seven. You know, uh, I haven't been changing our uh, title on the screen at all, have I? Kind of asleep here. NGC 6207, pardon me for not doing that. And go ahead and plate solve here real quick. Um, Stu, you're wild. <laughs> you're wild. This is a family live stream, people, Mike says. 6207 is a spiral galaxy located in the constellation Hercules, discovered by William Herschel on May 16th, 1787. And... It's located about 30 million light years from Earth. It's located near the globular cluster of Messier 13. Well, yeah, there's Messier 13 up there in the corner now. All right, so what we're going to do is turn on our live stacking here. This at about 20 second exposure with a gain of 100. And the name is already up there correctly. And let's just, for context, let's see where we are. So now we're in the Keystone, still fairly close to the horizon. This red line is the actual horizon, I think, of these trees. And then I dropped the photo uh, panoramic photo view down a little bit so we can see things that are just under the horizon and see when they're going to rise or set accordingly. So we're, we're kind of close to the horizon here, but this part of the sky is pretty dark, so it should be good to go. This is the keystone of Hercules, and right above it, you can see the uh, uh, famous, you know, Hercules cluster, Messier 13. So this galaxy, NGC 6207, is right here, very close. And, oh, right there it is, huh? So we'll hit the display histogram reset and reset the big histogram at the bottom. And, boy, that makes a nice view, doesn't it, with the, with Hercules cluster up there in the upper right. It's a really cool view. So here's actually the, the galaxy we're trying to see. And we'll just add a little bit more mids in hopes of giving it a little bit more punch. And it will as it, this live stacking process in the, in the RAM of the software, so to speak, we're taking one 20 second exposure after another and averaging them together so the the, um, the consistent starlights get lighter, and the um, grainy light pollution that's kind of tingling in the night, uh, that 
gets diminished because the software can see that it's not a consistent light source. The pixels aren't consistent, so it, it, it averages those down and it averages the stars up. So it's really a pretty effective um, software. SIF, actually you can get it for like the pro version for, I don't know, $16 a year or something. It's very affordable. Robin Glover, the programmer, keeps developing cutting edge stuff in it. So again, this is NGC 6207, it's object number 73. So let's just make sure we catch whatever Almira says here. He says, tiny spiral wonder hiding in the shadow of M13. And he, he includes it because it's in that shadow of M13. So very few people look at it, he says. And he remembers the first time he was at a Canadian star party called the Starfest, and he was with this guy that was looking at M13, and the guy hadn't paid any attention to this little galaxy. And when uh, Steve O'Meara showed it to him, he was so delighted that that's what caused O'Meara to put it in this book. He says it's one of the most understated spirals in the heavens. It's a little gem, and it just looks like a little oval smudge, he says. Sure enough, it's an underdog. He says he first uh, saw it through a nine-inch refractor at the Harvard College Observatory. He says uh, it's about 14 million. Is that what you said, Stu? Yeah, so the... the the galaxy is a thousand times farther away than the globular. That's amazing. Good pointing, pointing out that, Mike. Supernovas have been detected in this. It's small, so he recommends moderate magnification. Two arc minute long. It's just a dim puff. Maybe the puff is about one arc minute in extent. But that's what makes it cool, he says, because it's in the same field of view as M13. A foggy ellipse with a fuzzy central lens. He says, it's that simple. The core is quite concentrated. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Looks like a, a star. He says the disk almost looks like ears coming out from the star. Structureless elliptical wash of light. All beautiful in its simplicity like freshly fallen snow. Isn't he eloquent? We'll try to zoom a little past our, we're at 100% right here. Well, let's go past our optical zoom and see if we can pull out a little more structure of this. You can see a little mosaic pattern, but not much. Now we're in tight enough that we can start to see a little bit of detail in those outer spirals. And you can see how a person might be able to detect a supernova, because we can make out three or four dim stars here in this one, in this arm. Let's uh, do the observation on this and bring in Stu's uh, distance. Stu said it was um, 30 million light years away. Around 1,000 times farther than M13 in the same field of view. Um, Dean observed that the globular looks awesome. <laughs> That's right, Dean. He, he said he's partial to globulars and opens. 
Stu says, looks very convinced and red in the Hubble picture. The Hubble view shows it as condensed and red. NGC 6207. So that's seven minutes on it. Look how there's a cloudiness floating out here, like uh, maybe some kind of Star Wars galaxy or something. I love this view. I think we should grab a snapshot of this. And of course, M13 is the star of the show, all those greens and yellows. But this little secret deep galaxy is definitely making an understated beauty appearance, huh? It's nice. Needs another 20 minutes or more. You're probably right, Stu. But let's move on. Um, Let's go to NGC 5846, a galaxy in Virgo. NGC 5846. When moving to each of these, we use a little sequence in uh, SharpCap that's kind of like a little sort of Lego-like computer program that takes care of a bunch of steps automatically and that way we don't have to think as much in case I get to talking. It's a great part of the sky. It's a great part of the sky for us because with this part of the sky you can see where I'm sitting. And uh, Let's look at our um, Stellarium, uh, which is the planetarium software. With this photorealistic view, you can see the, the sides of our, of our observatory, just the way it would look if we were out there on top the scope. This is like, this is literally the view from the, from the lens of the front of the scope. And off to the right, you could see my truck if we were sitting there. And sure enough, my truck is parked there tonight. But look very closely at this building. Just, you might make out the brown of the building here. Right here in the corner is a, a little window. And up over the top is the rose cluster. Um, right beside that rose cluster is this galaxy we're going to go visit. And it's up about um, 26 degrees above the horizon. But what I'd like to show you while that's, you know, settling in over there in the telescope and it like I say that little software program we have running will automatically uh, plate solve and then start uh, uh, photographing imaging this this galaxy but I'm gonna just remind you here in the live view of the sky cam uh, take a look over here at that corner window. Keep your eye on that corner window. Now that's the emergency door out of my wing. But right there is the, is the window to my office. And I'm going to walk over there and open up the window just so you can be sure that that uh, view is live. I'm going to raise the shades and raise the window. I can see the, the moon outside. I'm going to use my red light first and I'm going to kind of see if you can see that. And I'm going to switch to white. It might be a little brighter. So here I am at the window waving at you. Now that's the live view. The view outside my window. You guys are looking right into my window and uh, 
That way you can be sure that I'm not just showing you some kind of snapshot. Now let's um, come back to the planetarium software and to the <laughs> oh wow, look at this galaxy. Wow, it's kind of spectacular, isn't it? Let's see, get all of our... settings and balance here. Looks like we can see several um, several galaxies here. Let's see, this is back in Virgo, isn't it? We spent some time in Virgo the other night trying to finish almost all of the Herschel 400. I think we have three targets left in the Herschel 400. And we were in the Virgo galaxy field for quite a while the other night, weren't we, gang? Okay, now that we've done another plate solve, and we didn't sync that time, we didn't synchronize it, just so we could get everything settled. Maybe now you can see here's 5846, which is our target of interest. But also in the same view, we've got um, 5845, 5839, 98, or 5850, 5831, 5841, 5838, and 5854. All of these in the same field of view, all galaxies. But the one we're interested in tonight is this one right here in the middle. Now that's 100% four minutes. This is uh, object 69 in Omira's list. I love it when he puts those big uh, big bars at the top with the numbers. Just helps you find his sequence of objects so much easier. And uh, Herschel 400 was the first book he did and we don't have these on it. This is an elliptical lenticular 5846, and he says he had never hunted it down till he tackled the Herschel 400 list, of which is a member. He's, that was uh, 5846, yum. Why does he like it so much? I guess because it's just such a big elliptical lenticular, you think? Uh, the Herschel 400 was actually done by that, uh, remember Stu, that club in uh, St. Augustine, Florida, the Ancient Skies Astronomy something or other club. And they curated it from the 2,500 uh, Herschel, the 2,500 objects that Herschel discovered. 7,000 suns in this galaxy. Um, tells you how to find it. Two arc minutes wide. Immediately obvious diffuse circular glow, very condensed that brightens to a core. Trapped between two stars. He has to use averted vision to see that. We can see it very plainly, can't we, in EAA. He says the galaxy is just obvious enough to see even from a suburban location. Obvious dual nature of the core which at times seemed triple. 
the southern part of the core. I guess he's he's seeing 5846A. What is 5846A? I have to go to his drawing, I guess. Unless he's calling that barred spiral, unless this is a galaxy. Thirty-five arc seconds south, fifty-eight forty-six A. I bet. I bet this is a galaxy here. Let's look again in our planetarium software. See, in other words, I bet this. Oh, he says that's a. Oh, that's a star. I see. Yeah, he doesn't. No, that must be a star. So what is 5846A? That's NGC 5850. Thanks, you guys, for explaining the NGC. <laughs> Thanks, Stu. Explaining all the catalogs. Um, boy, I'm kind of confused about this 5846A business. Okay, here's what he writes. NGC 5846 is also the brightest member of the NGC 5846 group, which includes other nearby splendors such as 5839, 5845, Oh, look, it is a galaxy. Look how it's annotated in um, sharp cap. So this is the A, 5846A, and that's 5846. And here is 5850. Well, that's pretty cool. You don't, all, you don't often see, you had to get very close to get that double annotation. You don't often see a double kind of galaxy like that, do you? It's really cool. Until you get into Virgo, I guess. We could easily split NGC 5846 from its non-interacting companion NGC 5846A. Tiffany, you're nice to say that. Uh, at first glance, 5846 looked trapped between two stars. But as it turned out, turns out, one of those is the galaxy itself. Another six or eight galaxies in this field of view. Pretty cool. And let's see, Stu, you said. Oh yeah, you wrote about 5846A. 0.7 arc minutes. How about that? Tidally stripped. All I had to do is read your write-up on this, Stu, and I would have understood this. 90 million light years away 
110,000 light years across. 5846. Now I don't think these annotations uh, show up in a picture, do they? Sometimes I wish we could take them with the picture because it is pretty cool when you get in these galaxy fields, isn't it? But I don't think they show up. All right, let's head to um, NGC 5466. And you see fifty four sixty six. Try to get back in the habit of doing that title again. And this is a globular cluster again in the constellation Bootes. Wow, it's a beauty, isn't it? The snow globe cluster. And for context, there's that ice cream cone, or kite, or club, whatever you want to picture it as. Uh, this is east. And that's northeast, so this would be east-northeast at around 53 degrees or so, maybe. 62 degrees. 62 degrees up in the sky. The snow globe cluster. Mike's uh, thanking Stu for all the content that he adds to the stream. I'm telling you, uh, you were right, Mike, to say thanks to him. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Stu, no one listens to me. <laughs> 5846, by the way, harbors a large number of globular clusters. Over 1,200 have been detected in images by Hubble Space Telescope. That's cool. That was the last object count, 5846. How do we get that back? Let's see, I'd have to go up here and say, ignore, and then run again. And then I have to put them, right here it is. And then I'm gonna edit that, I'm gonna edit that observation and add that. Hubble has spotted over 1,200 globular clusters. That's a lot. 150 in the Milky Way. Roughly the same size. Now I'm going to put uh, this observed thing back like I found it. And we're looking at 5466 here. This is just beautiful. It is very granular, isn't it? not as condensed as the Hercules we were just looking at. It really is like a snow globe.
it really does look like shaking up a snow globe. Very granular, not condensed like M13. Four six fifty four sixty six class twelve globular. I wonder what those are. What do those classes mean, Stu? Fifty one thousand eight hundred light years from Earth. Fifty two thousand eight hundred light years from the galactic center, and that's our Milky Way. In other words, this is this is rotating around our our Milky Way. Mike says, please don't stop unless you want to. The source of a stellar stream. What? Discovered in 2006, called the 45 degree tidal stream. 1.4 degrees. wide, extending from Boates to Ursa Major. What does that even mean? A, a stellar stream? Does it mean it's going choo 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 like in some Star Trek episode shooting stars at us? That's terrifying. Just kidding. But it is beautiful, isn't it? Beautifully lit. Greens, blues, whites. 5466. Nice. Our next object is a galaxy. It's uh, NGC 4450. NGC 4450. And it's located in COM, C O M. Coma. Coma Berenices, maybe? 57. Yep. So this is uh, NGC 50, 40, 40, A galaxy in Coma Berenices. In 1927 and 1929, Shapley and Sawyer categorized clusters by the degree of concentration of stars toward each core, known as the Shapley-Sawyer concentration class. It identifies the most concentrated clusters as class 1 and ranges the most diffuse as class 12. Well, that did look like a class 12 then. You're right. Stellar stream is an association of stars orbiting a galaxy that was once a globular cluster or a dwarf galaxy that has now been torn apart and stretched out along its orbit by tidal forces. Wow. So basically, yeah, shooting at us. So 4450 is over the top of Virgo. East, southeast. It's about uh, 68 degrees up. So pretty high. Two thirds of the way up toward the zenith. Wow, look, this is like the Hubble Deep Field here. Look at all these Messier objects M60, M49, M59, M58, 
M89, M90, M91, M88, Markarian's chain, the blow dryer galaxy. We were just there the other night, Silver Street Galaxy. But here in the middle is this NGC 4450. Boy, that's going to have some detail in it. Nice. After 80 seconds. It's got one of those dark dust lanes. It's going to make it look like an eyeball. Spiral galaxy in the constellation Coma Veronesis. Remember the Virgo cluster show smooth, nearly featureless spiral arms and few star, and few star formation regions. Nice spiral with dust lanes in the outer arm arms. This is fifty seven. Small but fairly bright, nicely compact. He says, who looks at NGC 4450? City lights of Los Angeles were bright for Edwin Hubble as he looked in the 100-inch reflector on top of Mount Wilson. The faint outer detail is lost because of the light background sky. Massive arms, though. Internal dust lanes are quite regular. Eighty thousand light years, right, Stu? Eighty thousand light year span, seventy billion suns. We're starting to see a little more of the spiral, aren't we? Look at that little eyelid there. Wow, that's cool, isn't it? <laughs> After just four minutes, we could digitally zoom in to 300% and make out a really cool dust lane in the lower arm as well as the spiral structure in fairly vivid detail. <laughs> 50 million light years.
I think this is a really cool galaxy. That's five minutes. Looked like a sleepy eyeball. Eye with the lid closed. Forty four fifty. Boy, we got to remember this one, guys. This is beautiful. Fifty million. Uh, next is uh, thirty-four, thirty-two. Thirty-four, thirty-two. NGC thirty-four, thirty-two. A galaxy in L my minor. Would that be thirty four thirty two? A galaxy in Leo, Leo Minor, yeah, You're in the middle of the northern US or Canada. It's clear outside. Go outside every few minutes as there may be aurora visible. That'd be cool. I don't see any aurora. <laughs> Don says it's still cloudy there. With its current interaction with UGC 5983, a nearby dwarf galaxy features tidal filaments and intense star formation. Four thirty two spiral reacting with UGC fifty nine eighty three. Man, thanks for being here. Looks like we have around 14 on the stream. If you haven't yet said where you're observing from with us, please pop that in. It doesn't matter what city you are, what country, we're glad you're here. This is NGC 3432. The Knitting Needle Galaxy. It does look like a knitting needle, doesn't it? That's 100%. Kind of grainy still at 80 seconds, but clearly a knitting needle. The 
to Tuaranga, New Zealand. Sunny afternoon. <laughs> This is nice. Beautiful. John, barred spiral, inclined 84 degrees. Three bright stars form a triangle around it. Oh yeah, I guess these, these three, huh? Or Maybe, yeah, I think these three. Telling the history of this. It says finding is difficult. Cool. All right, let's head to this open cluster. NGC 6811. NGC 6811. <laughs> yeah. SpaceX is, uh, you calling it stupidly big rocket. Tiffany, close to the old James Lake Observatory. What a great place to be from. Don says, fun to watch the launch. Sad it didn't make it to orbit. Stu, I was sure I was gonna, it was gonna blow up on the pad and when engines started blowing up, I was sure it was over, but it kept going for a while anyway, right? So 6811, NGC 6811 is what we're trying to find. Open cluster in Cygnus. Wow, this is just 15 degrees. I can see some trees here. But there's the cluster. This rose at 9.20 p.m., so it's coming up from the trees there. Maybe this is the cluster. Sixty-eight, eleven. 
Oh yeah. Never have we been so close to so many trees, huh?
Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. So is that back on now? Can you hear me again? All right. Man, sorry. That was crazy, wasn't it? I don't know how long this will last. Looks like um, it's working for now, but I don't have a lot of batteries left. Anyway, um, let's go back to this screen and see what we got here. Sorry about that. I should charge charge those more often. I end up just using them till they wear out. And I need to get in the habit of charging them. So here's this galaxy. Looks like an elliptical. Oh look, there's a little um, Is that some kind of one of those um, spur jet things? A relativistic jet? Wow, that would be cool if it was. Let's get these synced again. Hello, still going. Um, oh, sorry, I'm at uh, 40.
mic audio. Mic audio. Hello. Hello, hello. So are you hearing now? This is off of the silly um, the webcam. Can you at least think we can get by with this? Okay. Thanks, Don. Yeah, uh, now the mic receiver died. This is a nice little uh, mic set. It's by DJI, but you do have to charge it up in advance. So sadly, it's completely dead. I'll, I'll charge those. But now we're working off the webcam, so let's dive back in. So let's see. Here we go back to where we were, 4473 is right there. Why don't we just use the Stellarium current object and salute it out with Stellarium. And we already had started live stacking. I just moved it to try to find the object. All right, let's see what we've got now. wonder if we're looking at M87. Do a quick plate solve here. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna American Sign Language lip read. Okay, now we should be able to use the um, deep sky image annotation. 4473. Anybody see 4473? I don't. There's so many objects, it takes it a while to... See, that's M87 right there. Why in the world... NGC 4473... NGC 4473... Is supposed to be right there. And M eighty seven is over there. What in the world? Why is it so weird? The coordinates must be off or something, don't you think? Does anybody see 4473 in this maze of galaxies? I don't. So we've got M87, and then we've got 4503. So let's go back to Planetarium Software and look for 4503. NGC 4503. Yeah, it's way off. I'll tell you what let's do. 
we want to find this and it's not cooperating so let's go look at like this 4477 4477 current object slew let's stop live stacking stop deep sky image annotation go back to three seconds 100, 400 gain. Could be a problem with the scope. See how it's real tight next to the pier? I wonder if it Somehow it got confused or something. But it does appear to be tracking, oddly enough. Anybody have any theories? it moved any up here in the upper right we can see that tracking is enabled still plate solve succeeded yeah it hasn't moved So let's do this. Let's go to something like Arcturus. And get the scope figured out. Hmm, it's not moving, is it? Houston, we have a problem. Okay, let's do this. Let's go back up here and say, can you go back to the zero position? Oh, there it goes. So it was, I think, somehow it was jammed up against the pier. Okay, so it's at zero position again. Now let's try to go back to NGC 4473. Looks like it's trying to go back the way it was. I think it's just going to jam against the pier again. <laughs> it did. It says it's at 64 degrees. But man, it must be right, it must just be a problem with its, instruction set for this part of the sky, turn it off and back on again, that's about my limit of knowing how to fix electronics, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's effectively what we did. We took it back to zero position and I guess we could turn it off and back on, but 
did everything but that. It did it did plate solve and it is correcting its plate solve. It was off 1.3 degrees. But I don't think it's moving to do the correction. Strange. It's driving into itself. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it did solve again. 4477. Looks more promising, doesn't it? Right? Yeah, we're not on MA7. MA7 is over here now. So now we just need to find 4473. There's 4474. It still didn't center 4473, did it? How strange is that, that it got us back to Markarian's chain in this crowded section of galaxies. Tell you what, let's try going to this other galaxy, which is also in Mercarian's chain, but maybe not, oh, there it's moving at least, not the same one, not 4473. Let's try to go to 4461. be just a the way they're numbered is off or something one of the targets has a dual number forty four sixty one so here's forty four sixty one in the middle of the picture now forty four sixty one I saw 4473 in the middle of the picture too. So I think we're at least going to be able to find our targets now. Boy, if it's this confusing with deep sky image annotation, how hard would it be if you didn't have it? Right? OK. Now then, thanks for your patience while we sorted that out. So here's 4461, right in the middle. Another one of those smudges. And that's his target number 58. I wonder why he considered that to be secret deep. particular galaxy one of those little wonders possesses a seemingly dim magnitude forty four sixty one 
So right there, one that could turn people away from it, but in fact, owing to the galaxy's compactness, a reasonable target for small telescopes using a decent skies. Didn't include that. Might just be a little bit too faint, too small. Historical mystery. 4461 is probably the missing galaxy. 4443, of which there is nothing at the NGC position aside from 19th or 20th magnitude object. Hal Corwin of the NGC IC project proposed the link between 4461 and 4443. I see. So it, it is the subject of a confusion. I wonder if that's partly related to why it's, it was confusing for us a while ago. A very pretty spindle, bright central glow, stellar core, two elliptical extensions, looking like the ghost image of Saturn seen at low power when the rings are nearing edge on with care and patience it does materialize into a very tiny puff of pale light gently glowing lens of light star-like core and that's it 4461 when also known as 4443 that's what he was just saying lenticular 50 million light years away so let's go ahead and do the the written observation of this, 4461, a puff of light that see Omira thought resembled Saturn in his smaller scope. Oh my goodness. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, Stu. A puff of light that Omira thought resembled Saturn in a smaller scope. But in our scope, it does show a rounder, a rounder globular kind of dimension, doesn't it? We can see that central core. But it just looks like one of those other Her the, the Herschel 400s that we were looking at the other night, huh? Just a lenticular oval. This is at four minutes, but lenticular oval. Um, tidal interaction with 4458, also known as 4443, Stu said, 50 million light years away. Okay, so now having observed this, let's turn our deep sky image annotation back on. And then back off of this and see if we can find 4473. Oh, there it is. The mysterious 4473. I think the reason we couldn't see it a while ago is because it doesn't turn on until you get very close to it. Watch. Oh, it stays on now. There. See how it blinks off? And that caused us not to see it a while ago. But it's right there. So many galaxies that the deep sky image annotation is kind of, there's a latency. <laughs> I'm not touching it now, and it's continuing to, Zoom in. <laughs> wow, there we go. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm just going to stop zooming. Take this back off. 
And it's that. It's another lens like that. And this is object 60. Faint, round, a whisper away from the Virgo border. Messier and Machin overlook this. Forty-four seventy-three and forty-four forty-four seventy-seven. Slightly flattened into a disc. Lenticular early type, small oval. So what we're going to do here is we're going to just note, finally, for some reason, our scope kept, uh, I don't know, grinding to a halt here and wouldn't move. It was as if it had hit the pier, but it kept tracking, strangely. Anyway, finally found this, and Omira included it because Messier missed it, and he couldn't figure out why. Another oval lenticular smudge. I mean, that's basically what it looks like, doesn't it? All right. We have one more object here, and it is a quasar. Are we able to um, observe quasars? The scope's moving off of that point now. Seems to have settled. Now the designation of this is 3C273. 3C space 273 which must be a quasar designation. Seems to be pointing at absolutely nothing in Stellarium. How will we know when we find it, gang? Quasar by Motorola. Yes, I am that old. <laughs> My dad had a TV with one of the first remote controls that worked with crystals that emitted high frequencies when the buttons pressed. It was a quasar. <laughs> I don't know how we'll know it when we find it. But, you know, plate solving should get us on the coordinates. Three C two seventy three is a quasar located at the center of a giant elliptical galaxy in the constellation of Virgo. So there you go. Stu is rescuing us.
So will we see the galaxies too? In other words, Stellarium didn't have a galaxy there. Gonna look like a regular star, Don says. How do we know what star it is? Let me go get one other book. Hang on. I thought maybe I had Burnham's uh, Celestial whatever guide for this part of the sky, but I don't. So how are we going to know this when we see it? Nothing. There's 4409. Should we go like to um, 3C273 wiki? Does it say what galaxy? a large scale jet that's visible host galaxy it's a blazer optically brightest quasar first I don't know how we're supposed to know when we see it. Let's put our um, crosshairs on. So it should be right there. So, number 59, maybe Omira's got a map? Yeah, 
Yeah, he does. He says it's that one. See that bright star? Oh, screen, sorry. He see that bright star? He says this is 3C273 right there. We'll take a close up picture of it here. We'll put it in desktop sharp cap captures. We'll call it three C. 273 Quasar 6 minutes on 2023 0424. Well, this is certainly my first Quasar for whatever it's worth. How would we have ever known it was a Quasar? Okay, I'm going to read what you guys are writing. Um, 3C273 is a quasar located at the center of a giant elliptical galaxy in the constellation of Virgo. It was the first quasar ever to be identified and is the visually brightest quasar in the sky as seen from the Earth with a magnitude, with an apparent visual magnitude of 12.9. It's going to look like a regular star because it's so far away. The quasar is brighter than the galaxy, so it's right 2.4 billion light years away. Is that right? B as in billion? 2.4 billion light years away. Whoa. Mike says, look for the one with radio emissions. <laughs> 2.4 billion. If it was 10 parsecs away, it would be as bright as the sun. It means the quasar is over 4 trillion times more luminous. So over 4 trillion times more luminous than the sun. B as in bloody long way, Stu says. That's bright enough for me to find my keys. Just looked like another star but was so far away, I guess. Amazing. You know, guys, we would have never gone and looked at this if it hadn't been for Mira's book, would we? Which is a tribute to the idea of using these books, because we would have never gone and looked at this star thing right here. OK. Well, there you go. Um, there's an object at 8 and an object at, at 9 degrees above the horizon. We probably won't see those. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say ignore the horizon. And everything else is way below the horizon. So what this tells us is we're caught up with secret deep. And what that means is this book is done for a while too. We're caught up with Caldwell. We're caught up with Herschel. We have three more of those. We're caught up with Hidden Treasures, caught up with Secret Deep. That means next time we begin with Cosmic Challenge. So next clear night, like a week or so away, we'll start with Cosmic Challenge. This is by Phil Harrington, a completely different kind of book. And I think you'll enjoy it. I'm having to hand code in the list because um, there's no existing uh, 
file that I can find that I can import this list into uh, Deep Sky Planner. So once we get it hand coded, we'll make it available to the larger amateur astronomy community. So they'll have it for next time. And Deep Sky Planner is pretty good because as you hand code it in, it lets you verify the coordinates. So it's actually getting the coordinates to very fine uh, precision. So what we'll do is we'll come back to these every so often, like every three or four months. But we really only have um, 19 objects left in this secret deep. And you can go to the website, uh, emeraldhillskies.com, and see how many objects we have left. I think I've caught them all up now. Um, and under resources here, you can see that Messier Marathon, of course, we finished that in one night, all but M30. Um, Secret Deep, we were at 63 objects left, but now we've hit that twice, so now we'll be down to just 19 left. Uh, Hidden Treasures, we have just 17 left, and we have to wait till a different season. Caldwell list, we have 39 left, but we have to wait to a different season. Herschel list, we have three left, we have to wait to a different season. We're ready to start the Cosmic Challenge. So I hope you'll come back. If you like this kind of um, treasure hunting in the sky, I hope you'll hit subscribe. And if you like it, thumbs up. Uh, the bell would uh, alert you, and we're going to do uh, uh, clear night Easter egg hunts like this in the sky. Thanks to all those who pitched in, people like uh, Mike and Stu and Don and all you guys who pitch in to make this observing possible. Astronomy is a team sport for sure. And thank you. Stu says quasars are used by GPS satellites for precise locations. Wow, that's cool. Well, God bless you guys. Thanks to the Lord for making all the quasars up there. And we owe this all to him because he gives us something to see. Guess that's it for tonight. Good night and God bless from Emerald Hill Skies. We'll see you next clear night, maybe a week from now. See you. Good night.